Hello, and welcome to the RSE's Tea and Talk podcast series, a programme inspired by the coffee houses of the 18th century, where great thinkers would come together to discuss ideas and matters of the day. I'm Rebecca Widderfield, and I'm Chief Executive of the RSE, which is the Royal Society of Edinburgh and is Scotland's National Academy. Our mission is to advance learning and make knowledge useful. And as part of that, I'm having a series of conversations with some of Scotland's leading authorities on a whole range of topics, starting with exploring different perspectives on the coronavirus pandemic. The conversations are all with fellows of the RSE who are keen to share their expertise and experience. And this week, I'm speaking with RSE President, Professor Dame Anne Glover. Professor Glover is a microbiologist, but was also Scotland's first Chief Scientific Advisor and also served as Chief Scientific Advisor to the President of the European Commission from 2012 to 2014. So we're not in a coffee house, we're both in our own homes, which explains the occasional dip in sound quality, but I'd encourage you to grab yourself a drink of something, sit back and listen to one of Scotland's leading experts talk about things that matter. And science is used in, in all sorts of different ways and, and people doing science do different things. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about sort of what first got you interested in policy and working in that kind of environment. Well, as a, as a research scientist, I'd very much enjoyed working on my own research topic and working with others in the lab on research. But then as your career progresses, you get involved much more on how research is funded and the questions around that. And as part of my interest in that, uh, I joined the Council of the Natural Environment Research Council, who fund the UK's environmental research. And as part of being on the council, we then had to discuss with UK Treasury how we would Uh, determine what funding we had for the Natural Environment Research Council. And that gave me an insight into how how persuasive you had to be about the value of the, the knowledge that you were generating for your research and how to position that to identify for government who've, and in this case, UK Treasury, who had their hands on the purse strings, is to how to persuade them that there was real value for people in the UK for providing us with funding and that our job would be to ensure that the knowledge that we generated would then have impact back into the economy and for our environment and quality of life. So I think it, I think it was that, that you know, having had a successful research lab, I wanted to make sure that the knowledge that was being generated was used because the public pay for the generation of the knowledge. So a real focus on the sort of the, the application of that, that research and knowledge. And, and I guess from your diverse experience over a number of years, you'll, you'll have seen um, places where knowledge and science is being used particularly well in government and in policy and, and other areas where it's being used less well but I wonder if you could maybe give us a couple of examples of where you've been involved or where you've seen science being used in a really positive way to inform and influence government decision making. Yeah I I think a good example and one focused on Scotland was the gathering of evidence and its application on developing policy to be able to address people's exposure to smoke from people smoking in public places, cigarette smoking in public places. And that that was a really good example of evidence being gathered about the air quality, uh, following that up with data which uh, came from our health services about people presenting at hospitals. And this would be young people working perhaps in pubs and bars who didn't smoke themselves, but were exposed to a lot of smoke, but in an enclosed space and looking at their respiratory health, I suppose. Um, And then government developed a policy in Scotland to ban the smoking, ban smoking in public places. And after developing a policy and implementing it, then more data was gathered to see what impact had it on, for example, people presenting at hospital with respiratory disease. And I, I think that in the in the first year after implementation of the policy, there was um, a, quite a remarkable decline in the number of people of presenting. So a huge impact, a positive impact on public health. Now, that's an example of identifying a problem, gathering the evidence, 
developing options for policy, determining the best option, and that's a policymaker and a political decision. The scientist has kind of been moved, uh, is, is somewhat down the food chain from that. But then uh, once it's been implemented, following it up, because you want to know if you implement a policy, because not all policies will be perfect uh, for very good reasons, but then determining what has worked and whether that was a successful policy. So that's just one example for me of, um, of excellent evidence-based policymaking. And, and a really powerful example and, and one that has gone on to have, you know, huge impacts, obviously, on the quality of, of life and on, on life expectancy. I mean, from that example or just from your experience of being, you know, a chief scientific advisor, are there particular things that you think helped um, in the evidence being used um, constructively in, in that example or others? You know, what, what, what is it that really can support science being used in policy making and, and its development? Well, I, I think it has to be in an area where there's strong public interest. So people, most most citizens are very interested in health and um, how to improve health or, or how to be able to be in healthy environments. Um, and there was another, if you like, um, a more pragmatic issue, and that is that if you look at our our budget in Scotland, um, I think a public spending budget, um, the majority of the spend of the budget is in the NHS in Scotland. So with an ageing population and when you get older, the last 10 years of your life are normally when you are putting the most strain on the health service. Then I think uh, from government's point of view, government wanted a way to try and reduce demand on the health service. And Public health is a very good way to approach that because in many ways it's a preventative action. You're not waiting until somebody gets ill. You're trying to prevent them getting ill in the first place. So I think why it worked well is that there had been a lot of discussion about exposure to uh, passive smoking. Government understood that there was a substantial demand on health services from people presenting with these res respiratory problems. And so um, in a way it was a little bit like a marriage made in heaven because the science could be used in quite a, uh, in an area which didn't have much controversy surrounding it. There, there are always people who say, I don't want to be told not to smoke or, you know, and, and you'd expect that. And I actually, I don't criticize that. It's good for people to speak about, out about what's important to them. But the evidence was fairly overwhelming. So it was a low risk strategy for government uh, to develop policy. And it was also easy to identify what sort of policy uh, you could implement. So it's, it's actually fairly easy to say you can no longer smoke in a public place. And it's quite also it's quite easy to police. So all the ducks were in a row. That's why it worked. And I think one of the interesting things about what you were saying there is actually the, the combination of different types of science and evidence that were brought together. So the sort of the behavioural side of things as well and thinking about the sort of public acceptability. And, and obviously we're seeing the use of behavioural science in, in the current uh, work dealing with the pandemic. I mean, maybe maybe turning to, turning to that, how, how do you feel... Um, personally that science is being used at the moment in terms of supporting the response to the coronavirus pandemic um, does it reassure you how it's being used do you have any concerns about how it's being used um it's very interesting at the moment because one of the things that uh, i hear uk government saying a lot is that they are either being guided by the science or they are using the science and that's determining their actions regarding uh, the current coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, it's interesting to me that I can't actually answer your question and say what science is being used because that isn't in the public domain. I mean, we do know that, um, so the, the SAGE group, which is a science advisory group uh, for emergencies, they, they meet and they will be analysing data, they will be uh, communicating with government and that will be translated into the implementation of some of the policies that we're seeing, the most successful one being social distancing. Um, 
And I think that it would be good to hear a bit more about what science was being used. If only that if you know what's being used, then the huge number, we're a very research intensive country, particularly Scotland, but the UK in general, uh, then scientists, engineers, technologists, social scientists can all look at the evidence and can question or challenge it in in a positive way, you know, constructive challenge to say, have you, did you take this into account? Is this known? And it helps to refine the evidence. Um, and that would be good, I think. I, I'd like to see more transparency. And, and that's, I think that's a really interesting sort of insight, I guess, in terms of the way science is done, being very much a collaborative exercise that actually where knowledge builds on other knowledge rather than being you know one one set truth I mean do you think there are any circumstances where um it's reasonable for government to be um if not necessarily withholding evidence in science but delaying its publication I'm thinking particularly maybe areas where science is is developing how how would you be advising ministers to in that sort of setting I think there are quite a lot of areas where you would not be open with uh, scientific evidence. And that might be because there was some commercial sensitivity around the evidence that was being produced. It might be because there was there were real security issues, such as like a cyber security. If we were developing the use of data science, artificial intelligence to underpin a cyber security approach to keeping Britain safe from hacking attacks and so on then I think it would probably be best that you didn't divulge what the scientific thinking was underpinning it because then you're providing the the very gaps that I, I'm talking about, you would be exposing those and they could be exploited by the people that you're actually trying to defend against in the case of cybersecurity. So I, I do see in many instances um, when you might choose not to make the evidence uh, open and available but I would argue that if currently, for example, with um, the coronavirus pandemic, this is exactly the time where it's useful to have the evidence out there in the public domain so that people can pick over it. Um, I'll give you an example right at the very beginning. Uh, if we seems like a long time ago, but if we if we remember back um, there was a discussion that we might just let the virus flow through the population. And um, that thinking was probably based on historical approaches to seasonal flu influenza. And uh, to a large extent, that happens uh, with influenza uh, epidemics. However, um, we didn't know very much about this virus. Um, so we should, so a lot of people would have been if we knew that we were using thinking around influenza virus people might have said but this isn't influenza virus and and that would have been a, a sort of pause for thought for the scientists involved in providing evidence the reason is that influenza virus uh, it's normally a one for one like i might infect you but not many other people whereas we know that this coronavirus uh, one person can infect up to three other people. And that means a massive and very rapid infection. So you probably have to deal with it differently. Um, and we perhaps could have got, it's very easy to speak with hindsight, but we might have got to a better position. And for me, that would have been uh, locking down much more quickly to prevent the level of deaths that we are currently seeing in the UK, which which is uncomfortable. We, we've got a very high number of um, of deaths from this virus. So, so it sounds from um, what you're saying there is that, I mean, just the key importance of openness, wherever possible, accepting that there'll be in some situations, that's not always possible, but openness both in terms of um, an ability then to enable other scientists to develop and build on the knowledge and expertise to enhance understanding that we can then deal with something better, but also about um, the transparency and trust with, with the public. I mean, I do remember quite early on, SAGE did publish some of their reports and it was like a whole list of reports. And, and as even somebody from a research background, it was quite difficult to interrogate and think, well, what's that telling me? How is this being weighed up against other evidence or indeed against 
the different evidence that was being presented. How can government and how can scientists communicate to best effect to the public on issues that are often really, really complex and often quite technical? I mean, have you got any tips for how how that's best done? Um, yeah, I, I've been very impressed by a number of scientists who have gone to the trouble of you know, making short videos or um, producing animations of um, actually some people might have seen the one that I like the best, which is a large area with mouse traps on it with a ping pong ball in each mouse trap. And all the mouse traps are close together. And if you throw in an additional ping pong ball, they all fly off. It's like a chain reaction and every single one um propels its uh, ping pong ball into the air but if you do the same thing but you just move the mouse traps further away from each other and you throw in a ping pong ball hardly any mouse traps go off now what that is a brilliant visualization for is how social distancing prevents transmission of a very infective virus so i think scientists uh, and politicians to be honest need to use Uh, visual representation where they can. They need to use non-technical language because, um, you know, people talk about, you know, how infectious a virus is and they call it the the R number. Well, actually, that's not, you know, for a member of the public, R R number doesn't really help. So you need to be extremely clear. And just for, to be honest, if I look at the SAGE committee, for example, I wouldn't expect them to be uh, publishing all the minutes of the meeting, who said what and when and so on. But it would be very good to have a summary of the evidence. It would be good to say, you know, and and what the recommendations might be. Because what I would be anxious about, and I'm not trying to protect, because I'm a scientist, I'm not trying to protect scientists, but there is a danger that, if you're saying we're guided by the science and you don't tell anyone what the science is, you're almost setting the science up to be the fall guy, you know, is that, you know, somehow we can blame the science. And I think there's a danger of that in policy making. Um, Because often, you know, sometimes I I would hear politicians say things like, there isn't, the science is not certain on this, therefore we're not going to do it. And, if I know the area that they're talking about, I'll think, well, actually, the science is as certain as it's ever going to be on this. But you're choosing to somehow pin it on the science and use that as your rationale for not doing something that you really don't want to do in the first place. So in an ideal world, what I would love to see is that um, all of us in research, we produce knowledge Um, We should make sure that that knowledge is at the disposal of governments to help them make evidence-based decisions and evidence-based policy because they will be robust, they'll be resilient and long-lasting if they're based on evidence. But I think it's also beholden on the receiver of that evidence, government, to say that we've, we've received this evidence and for certain reasons we are not going to follow the evidence in this case. And I I actually also think that's perfectly okay as long as you're transparent about it. Um, I can give you an example of that if you want, or is that helpful? No, it is. And I was just thinking, I mean, you know, having worked in government both as an analyst and, and, and on the policy side, I mean, you know, policy is very hard, as you know, as well. I mean, it's often very, very challenging that, um, you know, there's there's trade-offs and competing things that governments are trying to achieve. And I think in the context of the current pandemic, um, the decisions and the different type of evidence that needs to be used uh, will be multiple. So being able to explain that to the public seems, seems really important. I mean, I think in terms of what you're saying about um, the sort of communication, I guess social media has enabled um, the science and to be communicated by um, and reached by many more people in different and more creative ways. I guess it's also enabled us to learn from what's happening elsewhere and in other countries. And I wonder if you, if you think there's other countries who are using science at this moment in time in a in a particularly uh, good fashion. 
So we, we have the advantage because other countries have been faced with the spread of coronavirus more quickly than we have in the UK. So we could have looked and we did have the advantage of being able to look and see what was happening in Italy. But in terms of uh, different responses, um, Denmark and New Zealand have both decided that what they would do is uh, a massive amount of testing, of tracing contacts and isolating. And that's resulted in a very much reduced death rate in those countries. And that strategy was informed by evidence. So um, that was a, a very good way to go. Um, interestingly, I've, I've just been speaking to somebody from Albania who was talking about um, her parents have been in isolation for 47 days. And I, I was because they've locked down much earlier in Albania. And um, so they have very few deaths. And I was asking, you know, so why did they do that? And that was a slightly different approach. That was an identification that the health service would not be able to cope. And so that the only thing that they could do was to try and prevent any spread. And so people have used evidence in different ways. Um, I think in the UK, uh, and again, it's a use of evidence, but the UK would have been wanting to protect the economy. And that would have been one of the main issues, because without doubt, our economy um, will be harmed by current lockdown conditions. Um, but the weight may have been much more on protecting the economy and may slightly have, as you said, it's, it's about balance and might have been thinking that we could manage with um, an increased spread. And, and unfortunately, the, the number of deaths that, that that would entail. So we've all used evidence differently. It's not that one country's used it and one hasn't. It's that we've chosen what evidence we use and we've chosen different responses to that evidence. And I guess I'm um, coming back to your point about the need to sort of evaluate things afterwards in terms of um, what's worked or hasn't worked with something that's moving so quickly. But there will be some really important lessons to be learned afterwards about how do we support resilience um, in, the, in the face of whether it's another pandemic or something, something, something else. Um, I mean, one of the things we've seen from the scientific community is a, is a really phenomenal response in terms of coming together to try and address the issue, to think about what's required. There was an article in the Times Higher just today or yesterday about whether this is sort of helping break down disciplinary silos. And I wondered if you've got any sort of thoughts on reflections in terms of how science is done and how, how research is done. I do think that science responds very well. I'm using science and engineering or science to mean both, but uh, and all different types of science. But scientists do respond very well. And when I was two times, I've been a, a chief scientific advisor in different circumstances. And I was always absolutely stunned and enormously grateful with the generosity that people have in providing evidence and to um, to support the analysis of that evidence and look for uncertainties and so on. It's extremely helpful. But I think that you're right in terms of uh, how we do science. Uh, historically, we've all put our specialism in a very small, narrow box. And, and we've. when I studied my first degree, which was in biochemistry, I mean, I, I just thought about biochemistry. That's all I, all I thought really mattered. Whereas a successful biochemist today in research would be uh, speaking to data analysts, be thinking about cybersecurity, looking at um, analytics with uh, different uh, immobilized chips, being able to do rapid high throughput screening. Um, we might talk to physicists or material scientists about different things that we could do. And... Um, and I, I know latterly in my research career, that's what I also did. Um, and actually, it was very much better because we, we're we all in danger of speaking to people who are just like us because it's comfortable space to be in. But actually, it's very much more interesting speaking to people who are not like you because it, it broadens your mind. 
uh, to all sorts of different possibilities and it allows you to be much more creative and inventive. So um, some of the best conversations I've had are with people who are outside my area of specialism. And it, it also comes back to a point you made earlier. It also instills in us the discipline not to use um, very uh, subject specific terms that nobody else will understand. We have to make our language general in order to be able to, um, you know, to communicate effectively and get something out of, uh, uh, of, the, of the discussion. And I, I'd argue that the best scientists are also, um, can also be very, very good at simplifying and making clear what they're talking about without having to use specialist language. That just acts as a barrier. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it will be interesting to see if, if actually the, the current situation will, will help reinforce and accelerate the move towards more interdisciplinarity. Um, I mean, it's interesting, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Scotland's National Academy is quite different from other academies, as you know, in terms of encompassing the breadth of academia, but also reaching into public service and, and business. And, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you think um, the science being used and scientists working alongside industry at the moment in time, you know, what's that teaching us? Well, I think it's a, it's an enormous strength because um, if you if you just keep anybody in a box with their specialist knowledge, they don't really appreciate the possibilities of how that knowledge can be applied. That's one of the enormous strengths of the RSE as, as Scotland's National Academy is that we bring the best of contribution across the whole spectrum of society and we bring that together under the roof of the RSE. And um, our, our whole purpose, as you said, about knowledge made useful is to get that knowledge and to put it at the disposal. And it's not individual packets of specialist knowledge it's synthesizing that knowledge together and then providing that um, for government uh, in policy making, uh, for business in terms of opportunity, for our creative arts and, and music in Scotland. But probably most importantly, just for individual citizens, we, we are there for the people of Scotland to make, um, to put knowledge at their disposal, to make Scotland the best it possibly can be and um, that's as, as that's our mission and that can only be done by breaking down the barriers between the different disciplines and between things like um, business theatre the arts uh, music poetry uh, nuclear physics uh, virology um, 18th century history whatever your specialism is um, you've got something to contribute and we are the channel that allows that excellence of contribution to be channeled into society for society's benefit. Thank you and, and, and I guess what comes across is just like RSC you know individually you've really got a very clear commitment to the research and the work that you do having an impact and, and making a difference. I mean clearly you've been in very very senior roles and, 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 and very specialist roles both in government and, and, and in academia have you got any advice for sort of maybe somebody who's a more junior in their career who's who's really interested in in, in in policy, really keen to make a difference, but doesn't quite know how to go about it? What would you where would you where, where should they start? <laughs> um, well, if they were interested, then I, I would I would be delighted that that was the case. So um, I think a lot of people, scientists, don't like to put their head above the parapet. You know, they're afraid of taking that risk and and stepping into these different environments. So um, what would I suggest they do? Well, I, I'm president of the RSE, so I'm going to say this, that one of the things that I would do is um, the RSE is open and welcoming to all. I mean, you can actually physically just walk into our building on George Street, but you can certainly get in touch with us. And you can say that, you know, I work in an area, the knowledge I generate, I think could be useful for society or policy making or whatever, um, who can I talk to? And we've got a number of terrific staff at the RSE who work at this interface, um, the executive team between uh, knowledge and society. 
and so can help translate that. Um, there also, um, if you're in Scottish, in Scotland rather, um, Scottish government generally, I think, is open. Uh, to feeding in ideas and that can be done through uh, more local groups and organizations uh, it can be done through institutes maybe for where you work or your university uh, if you work in a university so there are lots of channels and you just need to start asking um, and I, I think that the the most important thing is is appreciating that the knowledge that you're generating could be useful and you're feeling that it's your it's your obligation in a way it's your responsibility to get that knowledge uh laid out for the benefit of uh populations whether it's people in Scotland the UK or globally well, thank you very much, Professor Dame Anne Glover, for sharing your knowledge and expertise today around the use of scientific evidence in in policy making and and uh, contributing to our first uh, TN Talk uh, podcast series. Thank you. Thank you.